Well, hey everyone, welcome to Church of the King. We are so excited you're here. And can you believe that Easter is next weekend? We cannot wait. It is gonna be amazing. And you chose the best place to be as we prepare for Easter weekend to be in church with us yes. today. So thank you for being here. We have such a powerful service in store. My name's Christian and this is Leah and we get the privilege of being your host here today. Yes, Christian, how cool is it that we get to gather with all of our friends all over the awesome. world. So cool. We believe that no matter where you are, who you are, or when you're watching, you are welcome here at Church of the King. Absolutely. And hey, you picked a great day to be in church as we wrap up our series, How to Live Through a Bad Day. Today, we are going to be looking at one of the most famous lines that Jesus shared on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As we look at this statement, Pastor Steve is going to be unpacking the best way to respond when others hurt us, to forgive them, to let it go. And maybe you know someone who's struggling with that very thing. Maybe you know someone who's struggling with unforgiveness, who needs hope, who needs to know that there's potential for reconciliation and restoration. Why not click that share or invite button right now, invite them to service, bring them along with you. And who knows? Maybe through the message, through the good news of Jesus, God will change their life forever. Yes, Christian, that is so true. We believe that today's message is going to be phenomenal. And we believe that no matter who you are, where you are, there is a time and a place for everything. And right now, in this moment, we're gonna go into a time of worship where we worship our Savior and our King. So I wanna encourage you, hey, stand up where you are, sing these words out. Let's worship together as we join in with our worship team. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to church, everybody. Online family, welcome. Thank you for joining us all across the world and all across this room today. Let's lift up the mighty name of Jesus, amen. He's worthy. Come on, every boy. When I see the battle, you see my victory. Yes, he does. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. Yes, it does. There's nothing to fear now, for I'm safe with you. We sing. So when I fly, fly. For me, 
online. We get to join with all of heaven, declaring God's worthiness, declaring the praise and thanksgiving that we have towards King Jesus for what he's done. God, let us be reminded of who you are today. Come on, church, let's sing this together. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the free Now my life is yours I will sing of your goodness forevermore Worthy is your name, Jesus You deserve the praise Oh, worthy is your name Worthy is your name Jesus, you deserve the praise, oh, worthy is your
Come on, can we lift up that chorus one more time? Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. we just simply rest in the presence of Jesus today. We turn our eyes, we fix our gaze on him, his wonderful, beautiful face, full of majesty and grace. sing that out together one more time. Praise them together. Thank you, Jesus. Before we enter into this last song, um, never done anything like this before, but my name is Annalise, and this is my amazing God-fearing husband, Blaine. And we've had the honor of serving here for the past two and a half years, which has been an incredible journey. And um, currently we are 37 weeks pregnant, <laughs> which is such a delight. And um, this is our last, well, this is my last time serving with you guys before our miracle baby comes. And I thought better late than ever to share, of you, to share with you guys the testimony of the goodness of God in our life. Uh, we've really seen the Lord show up like never before. We struggled with infertility for about a year and a half. Um, doctors told me specifically that it would be really hard for me to get pregnant. They said, it might take years, it might not happen at all. So just prepare yourself. But I, I held onto this promise that I knew that God was gonna do a miracle in my life, in our life. <laughs> and here we are at the end of this journey and I wanted to share this with you guys because I know that some of you in here are contending for your own miracles. And as we sing this next song, I wanna remind you guys of this one verse. It's Ephesians 3:20. it says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask, think, or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. I wanna remind you today that the God of the immeasurable the God of the impossible is working on your behalf. So let us stir up our faith. Let faith rise in the room. Whoever in here is contending for something, I believe that God is working on your behalf. We've seen it in our life. We're believing it. he's gonna do it in your life, amen. The God of more than able, he's in the room. He's with you online. And we're just gonna believe together. God is doing something, he's at work right here and now. Come on, Blade, sing it. 
When did I start to forget All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith for the impossible How did I start to believe You weren't sufficient for me Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You are more than able yes, We Lord. sing You are more An amazing time of worship together with our church family this weekend. And let me just take a second to encourage you 
no matter what you're facing in life, no matter what you're coming up against, maybe even feeling like you're coming up against some impossibilities, God is greater than those things and he's more than able to intervene supernaturally in our lives and to really speak words of life and hope into our circumstances. So I hope that you're encouraged and that you're excited about what God wants to continue to do in your life as we go on with today's service. If we haven't met before, I want to take a second and introduce myself. My name is Simon, and I serve as the online campus pastor here at Church of the King. And if you're new here, I want to give a special welcome to you. Thank you for being with us today. You know, here's the thing. I don't believe that you're here by accident. Whether this is your first time or your thousandth time, God has you here, and he has you here for a reason. He wants to speak to you. He wants to minister to you and do something special in your heart today. And if that is you for that, you're here for the first time though, I would love to have the opportunity to just follow up with you this upcoming week. And the easiest way for me to do that is if you simply click the link in the chat room if you're watching it live, or you can just follow the instructions that are gonna be on the screen. What that allows you to do is to just take one minute to fill out a short form, letting us know a little bit of your information so that I can personally just follow up with you and connect with you. And so I'm really looking forward to just connecting with you and talking with you a little bit more this upcoming week. Well, here at Church of the King, we're celebrating something very special next weekend. What is it? It's Easter at Church of the King. It's going to be so good. So let's check out this short video, and I'll be right back. Can you believe that Easter is just one week away? It's really kind of crazy to think about that we're gonna be celebrating Easter next weekend together with our church family. We're looking forward to it. We're gonna have multiple services across all of our physical locations and of course here online. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there for one of our Easter services. And let me just encourage you and challenge you to bring someone with you. It's the perfect time to bring someone to church. It's really a, a time where Pastor Steve gives a very clear presentation of the gospel about how Jesus came to earth for us. And the reason that Jesus came was to offer salvation and life change and forgiveness for us. So think about somebody that needs to be here for our Easter services next weekend. Bring them with you. Let's believe that God would use you and your simple invite to really transform someone's life with the good news of Jesus for eternity. It's gonna be a powerful time. Can't wait to see you there. Before we go into this last message of how to live through a bad day, we always wanna take a second to just say thank you so much, Church of the King, for your faithfulness with the tithe and for your generosity over and above that to offerings. And here at Church of the King, we call those people Kingdom Builders. It's a group of people who have chosen to sacrificially give over and above their tithe, any amount, to really help us accelerate the vision of reaching people and building lives. So for your generosity and your faithfulness in that area, I just wanna say thank you so much. God is using you. And man, we're so excited about what God's gonna to continue to do as we walk out this thing called generosity. So as you're giving this weekend, we're gonna put some easy ways to give on the screen right now to make it super simple for you. And with that, we're jumping into Pastor Steve's final message of how to live through a bad day. I think it may be the best one yet. I'm really excited about it. So let's get our hearts ready to receive what God wants to speak to us personally. Yes, you and me, I believe God has a word for us. So let's get ready for that. Then we'll see you right after.
welcome all of our locations and those joining us online to our fifth and our final message in our series entitled, How to Live Through a Bad Day. Come on, can we just welcome all those that are joining us? And we're super excited to have all of you with us. So we're finishing up our series looking at the last statements that Jesus made from the cross. Today, I want to talk to you about when you're having a bad day, be forgiving. I'll never forget in 2008, I was going through a tough season, and uh, we were actually building our Little Creek campus, and there were some commitments that were made to us by an institution. And uh, there was a financial meltdown, many of you remember that, and I remember having a discussion with several of the people at this institution, and quite honestly, they just weren't honest. And, And I remember walking away from that conversation, and in my heart, I just felt like, violated. I thought, man, I was offended. I was like, you you guys said one thing and you actually are doing something opposite. Probably a week or so after that, I felt a heaviness come on me. I I literally felt a spiritual and an emotional heaviness come on. I remember one morning in prayer, it was so distinct, the Holy Spirit literally spoke to me and said, Steve, you need to forgive. It was that morning when I went through what I'm going to teach you today through an act of my will and obedience to Christ's word. I literally made a choice to forgive. I want to talk to you today about the power of forgiveness. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. In verse 32 to 33, the scripture says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. I want to press pause and I want to review just for a moment what brought Jesus to this point. One of our famous scriptures that we talk about, matter of fact, you see it at football games, John three sixteen. for God so loved what? Everybody say it. The world, that he gave his only what? Begotten son. That whosoever shall what? Believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the moment to consummate that literally giving of Christ to the earth, the moment that he came for to give his life, to perish for us. It's interesting, I was thinking about kind of reviewing this week all of what brought him up to this point. Again, a miraculous birth with Mary, a sinless life. He begins his ministry at 30. He's baptized by John, his cousin in the Jordan River. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He begins to do miracles and open blind eyes and open deaf ears. And He loves people unconditionally. He empowers people to walk away from sin, go and sin no more. I mean, a miraculous ministry. And then he's betrayed. He's betrayed by one that was close to him. And then a mock trial before the Sanhedrin. And then he goes before Pilate Friday morning. And remember what Pilate said? I find no fault in this man. A literal innocent man is dying as a criminal. He was dying as a criminal who was innocent. And this is the moment. There's one criminal on the right, there's another criminal on the left, and he's in the middle. Week one, we talked about the dialogue and the interchange between the two criminals and Jesus, and ultimately one owns his sin, he owns his life, and he he cries out, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. I, I begin to think about the the complete control that Jesus was in. The Bible says he could have called down a legion of angels literally and taken him down from the cross. And yet, and yet, and yet he chose. He chose to give his life a ransom for you and I. And as they put him on that cross, and as he walked up to Golgotha, and then they raised him up on the cross, by the way, after beating him, after spitting on him, putting a crown of thorns on his head, mocking him, oh, you're the king of the Jews, then blindfolding him, prophesy. I mean, literally, humiliation. And they raise him up 
on that cross, boom, and the two, one on the right and one on the left. What would you do? What would you do if you were absolutely innocent and you were going through something like that? What would your first words be? Think about it just for a moment. We'd like to believe that we would have a Christ-like attitude. We'd like to believe that we would respond differently. We would like to believe that, that we would somehow, we, we'd like to believe a lot of things, but the reality is whatever's on the inside of you comes out of you when you're in a moment like that. And the very first words, not the second words, not the third words, not the fourth, but the very first words that come out of the mouth of Jesus. When they literally raise that cross up, are found in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Listen to this. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He didn't curse them. He didn't call fire down on them, but he forgave them. I wanna talk to you today about the power of forgiveness what it does on the inside of us, what unforgiveness does on the inside of us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. It's actually a prayer. Jesus prayed a prayer. He prayed a prayer over the very persecutors, over the very people that would be considered his enemies. He literally prayed a prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I wanna talk to you about the significance of the prayer of Jesus from the cross in three ways today. Number one, this prayer, in this prayer, Jesus fulfilled prophecy. 700 years before this event, Isaiah, the prophet, prophesied that this day would actually happen. It was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah that literally this day would happen. What do I mean by that? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. Listen to this. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered among the transgressors. He was numbered. In other words, he was right among the criminals. 700 years before this moment happened. If you weren't here last week, I talked about the power of messianic prophecies. There was over 300 in the Bible that said, this is gonna happen. This is where he'll be born. This is how he's gonna die. This is what his stripes on his back. And one of the prophetic words about Christ is this one. He is numbered among the sinners. There's a criminal on the right, and there's a criminal on the left. Matter of fact, the very death of Jesus on the cross was a prophetic testimony to the veracity of the Old Testament scripture. There's coming a Messiah. Here he is, and he's come to die. The Bible says, it goes on, it says, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession. Can we say that word at the count of three? All of our locations, the word intercession. One, two, three. Say it intercession. What does it mean he made intercession? I tell you what it says. He made intercession for the transgressors. It means he prayed. Think about that for a moment. When was the last time somebody wronged you? Somebody hurt you? And the very first thing that you do is pray for them. No, man, we think things. Well, you guys are holy, but I think things at times. Man, when you're hurt emotionally, you go through something and Somebody wrongs you. The last thing, I mean, just think about the last time you got into a conflict with somebody, the last time with a spouse, with a child, with a coworker, is the very first thing that you do pray for them? Is that the very first thing? I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine you're in an argument with your spouse and say, Father, forgive her for she knows not what she's doing. I'm not sure that's ever happened outside of Jesus. Okay, sorry, ladies. Forgive him, for he knows not what he's doing. The Bible says that he was numbered among the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many. He made intercession. It's a big word. It means to pray for. He prayed for his offenders. Forgive them, O oh God. And with these words, this prayer, Jesus fulfilled a 700-year-old prophecy. Number one, what does the prayer that Jesus made from the cross, what does it testify to? It testifies to the power of fulfilled prophecy. He prayed for the transgressors. Number two, the second thing is Jesus modeled the importance of prayer when you're hurting. 
Think about it just for a moment. How did he begin his ministry? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray, our Father. How did he begin his public ministry? His disciples came to him one day. In the very beginning of his ministry, they had seen him. He'd wake up. He'd go pray. and He's like, man, where, where's Jesus going in the morning? They'd stay up all night. They'd be talking. They'd be hanging out. And like, hey, where's Jesus? Like he gets up in the morning and he goes behind a rock somewhere. Like what is he doing behind that rock? And then one day they snuck up on him. And like, oh, wait, wait. He's like talking to his father. So when we're sleeping and we're not waking up early, he's going, the Bible says, long before sunlight, he's going out and he's actually talking to his father. And one of his disciples said to him, Jesus, look, teach us how to pray. And you know, we call it the Lord's Prayer. It's actually the disciples' prayer, our Father who art in heaven. So he taught, so he began his ministry doing what? Teaching, watch this, the power of prayer. And now in this very last breath, he's actually teaching and modeling the power of prayer. He taught and modeled and he taught and modeled in the beginning and at the end. The power of prayer. Prayer sustains us. Prayer equips us. Prayer fills us. The power of prayer, how often prayer is our last resort and it actually should be our first response. The power of prayer. Jesus on the cross modeled prayer. It's interesting, who is he praying for? He's praying for the very people that put him on the cross. He's praying for his enemies. He's praying for those that were farthest away from God. Have you ever prayed a prayer for somebody who's far away from God? Yeah, you ever prayed a prayer and thought, you know what? I don't know if it's going to work. I'm just going to kind of throw something out there. Just, it's almost like throw something against the wall to see if it sticks. Jesus prayed a prayer for those that were far away from God. But I tell you, he didn't pray it in doubt. He prayed it in faith. Yeah. I'm so grateful for my parents. I'm so grateful for my parents. I'm grateful that they prayed for me. I was far away from God. I was way far away from God. You, you've heard the story. My parents made me go to church, and I was a rebellious kid all the way into college, and, 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 and finally gave my heart to Christ. Matter, matter of fact, my mom, some of you that don't know this, my mom had a Bible study on Tuesday afternoons, strategic, at my house at 3 o'clock. So you had all these spirit-filled ladies. With all, matter of fact, there's a, girl, there's a lady in the church, Lauren Dufour, who was 16 years old. I was 14. She's a couple, she's, actually, she's way younger. But anyway, no, she's a couple years older. And she was one of the girls there. They're, the ladies were in their 20s and 30s and 40s, and she was a young teenage girl. And here's what they did. When I'd walk in from school, they would all put their hands out, and my mom would say, pray for my heathen son, Steve. Every Tuesday, I thought they were crazy. No, they were praying because they believed that God answered prayer. Matter of fact, I'll never forget one day when I came home, I thought I finally ran them off. Y'all heard the story? And they were in my room anointing my room with oil. They were pulling down my Led Zeppelin posters. Come on. ZZ Top. They're putting oil all over my Panama Jack shirts. Come on. How many of y'all remember that? How many of y'all remember Panama Jack? Come on. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I want to encourage. This is for a mama. This is for a dad. Let me tell you something. Keep praying for your kids. Keep praying for your daughter. Keep praying for your son. Because the power of prayer moves heaven and earth. How many of y'all believe that God answers prayer? God answers prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up praying for your kids. I think it's also interesting that the very people that he prayed for that day. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Those were actually some of the same people that were there on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 got born again. You never know. You never know the seeds. You never know the seeds that you're planting when you respond correctly in prayer. You, you never know the seeds that you're planting in a child or in a friend or in an enemy. You never know. You never know the seeds I wonder how many people that were there that day on the day of Pentecost, literally 50 days after this, the, the, the moment of the cross, the Pentecost means 50, 50 days after Passover. How many people finally, when they were hearing Peter preach on the day of Pentecost, their hearts melted because they saw Jesus die? Wow. Number one, what did the prayer of Jesus from the cross mean? Number one, it fulfilled prophecy. Number two, Jesus modeled the importance of prayer. Number three, the third thing that we see about the significance of the prayer of Jesus from the cross is 
Jesus revealed man's greatest need. No, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, Father, heal them. Notice what he didn't say. Father, bless them. Those are important. But healing and blessing are not your greatest need. Your greatest need is the forgiveness of your sins. Father, what? Say it. Forgive them. The reality is that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. He, he, he was the one that came to die on a cross for the sins of humanity. I'm reminded of Matthew 26, 28. He said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus revealed the greatest need that we have. I wonder how many people in our culture, today, man, they're working their job. They're saying, man, if I could just have enough money, if I could, there's nothing wrong with that. God wants to bless us, but, 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 but what is man's greatest need? Somebody that's dealing with some other situation. There's nothing wrong. God wants to help us. God wants to heal us. God wants to bless us. But the greatest need that humanity has, the greatest need that he has, the greatest need that she has is to be forgiven of their sin. How many, how many real things in our lives are tied into an unclean conscience? Because we've not been forgiven, because we still have a, a break in our relationship with God which then causes a break in our relationship with others. Adam, where are you? Sin severs our relationship with God. Then it affects our relationship with others. And ultimately, unresolved sin affects our relationship with self. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I think it's so important, for they know not what they're doing. How many times does somebody say, well, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I want to appeal to everyone at every one of our locations. This is so important. Ignorance does not equal innocence. Let, let me say it again. Ignorance does not equal innocence. Well, man, I didn't know. Can I tell you, every single person that's ever been born on this planet, they have a moral conscience. Yeah, our culture today, you can hide the Bible, you can, you can make it prohibitive, you can burn Bible, you can get, can I, but you can't run from your conscience. And there's a right and there's a wrong. And when you sin, your conscience is tweaked and you feel guilt. Why? How do you get the guilt off your life? When you ask for forgiveness. The greatest need that mankind has is the need to be forgiven of their sin. And when you repent of your sin, oh God, come into my life. And maybe that's where some of you are right now. You, you've been thinking it's everything else. Well, it's my wife. It's my husband. It's my kid. It's my job. It's the government. It's the lack of this. I don't have. No, the greatest need you have is to start with your sins being forgiven. And when you confess your sin, God, I've sinned against you. Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. Jesus Christ said, Father, everyone say it, forgive them. My question is, have you been forgiven of your sin? In just a moment, when I finish the message, I'm going to give you an opportunity. And maybe you've been coming to Church of the King for weeks or months, or maybe you're watching on TV, online, whatever location. The greatest need you have is to be forgiven of your sin. How often do we hurt people and we do not know what we're doing? How many times have you had a relationship with somebody and they come to you and say, man, listen, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you realize this, but when you said that the other day, you, you really hurt me. But the moment you know it, the moment you have knowledge of it, can I tell you, you gotta do something about it. If you deny it, if you circumvent it, if you go around it, can I tell you something? You don't, you don't walk in the fullness of, of what's possible. How many people are living with a guilty conscience because they've not asked God to forgive them of their sin? So what do we do, Pastor? What do we do? Number one, we're going to ask God to forgive us. But number two, what do we do? What do we do when we've been hurt? What do we do when we've been hurt by people? How do we respond when we have unforgiveness in our heart? Forgiveness is interesting. We, we, can, we, we need forgiveness from God, but then we often need forgiveness from others. Relationship is both vertical, but it's also horizontal. And maybe you, you realize that you've You've got unforgiveness in your heart like I did towards this particular, actually it was two people at an institution. I felt like they lied to me. I felt like they weren't honest with me. And I almost felt justified having an ought in my heart. You ever been there before? 
feel like you're just, I feel like, you know what, if you know, and by the way, we're so smart, I, well, let me say this, we're actually not smart, but we're slick. We build little coalitions to justify why we can have unforgiveness. Can you believe what they did? Yeah, that's terrible. You know what, you ought to say, uh, you know, those people, and, and, look, and yet, and yet, and yet we won't deal with our unforgiveness at times. It slowly erodes our heart, it erodes our mind, it erodes our conscience. So what do we do when someone has hurt us? Number one, what would Jesus do? Pray for those who hurt you. Look at Luke chapter six, verse 28. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Who was mistreating Jesus? The Jews were. Who was mistreating Jesus? The Romans were. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Could you imagine the quality of our lives if we actually did that? Think of how many times we feel justified in doing just the opposite. We don't want to pray for those. We want people to be smited. Smite them, oh God. Do y'all remember that, that, that smite them, thy mighty smiter? Do y'all remember that movie? What is that movie? I can't remember. But anyway, we want justice, oh God. Do you really want justice? Is that what you really want? You really want justice? God, I wish you'd get them. Is that, what, is, is that, do you really want God to get them? Wait a minute. If God gets them, then God surely needs to get you. I mean, think about it. You want to talk about equality? You want to talk about equity? You want to talk about God getting them? How about God getting you for your sin, for your attitude, for my sin? Wait a minute. Do we really want that? Pray for those who hurt you. Bless those who curse you. I, um, I, I'm reminded of another situation in my life. Those of you who know my, my dad, my stepdad, who raised me since I was five. And uh, by the way, it's my mom and my stepdad's anniversary day, 50th year anniversary. Those of you that know it, 50 years. <laughs> and I texted him and celebrated this morning with them. And what, what a blessing. And, uh, but, but, I, but I have a biological father. And uh, he was out of my life from 12 to 18. At 18, he came back into our lives. And uh, he, had, he had an alcohol problem and different, lots of different issues in his life. And, and I, I remember when we were 20, we really had a falling out. He said some really horrible things to me. I mean, literally. I mean, it was under an alcoholic rage and cursing me out and blaming me for things. I'm telling you, it really hurt me. I mean, big time. I was vulnerable. I felt like I was open. I was open. I made myself vulnerable. And I mean, it was just like arrows. I don't know if you've ever had, I don't know if you've ever been the object of someone's scorn when they're, when they're totally drunk and they say things and you're vulnerable to them. It really goes deep. I remember about six months after that, I just, I just realized that just there was some real stuff that was growing in my heart. By the way, unforgiveness brings oppression on your life. It, it literally brings a, 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 an oppression, a demonic oppression. The Bible talks about the tormentors that come into your life. And I literally felt like my life, I'm a Christian, I'm a junior in college, I'm serving the Lord. I just made a decision that I wasn't going to go to law school, that I was going to graduate from college. I was going to go to Bible school. I felt called. And, and yet on the inside of me, my insides were literally being eaten up. And I met with a pastor and I, and, and I said, man, I don't know what's going on with me. I feel like this oppression in my life. And he brought me back and he brought me through different relationships and, and he was wise enough. By the way, that's what I love about our small group leaders and all of our pastors and all of our location that are, that are spiritual wisdom filled men and women to be able to help you because what they helped me, what this man helped me with is he said, Steve, when, when did this happen? I said, it was about six months ago. I just feel like this oppression. And he literally brought me back and we talked about that event. And in that event where I made some bitter root judgments, I, I remember saying to myself, I'm never, ever, ever going to let anybody hurt me like that again. You ever been there before? You ever said that before? Where you've made a bitter root judgment, you said, you know, basically you said, I'm going to take my life in my own hands and I'm never going to be vulnerable to people. Again. Truth is, the truth is, when you make a bitter root judgment and you draw a boundary like that, listen, you often do it to everybody and you just wall yourself off. I'm not suggesting we don't have boundaries with toxic people. I am saying you got to keep your heart open to some people. He led me through a 
forgiveness. And I remember praying for my blood father. And I, and I remember then writing him a letter. And I, remember, and, and I remember even I was making a decision. Everyone say decision. I remember as I was making a decision, it was almost like the pus, and I don't mean to be gross, but it was almost like the toxicity and the unforgiveness. It was almost like the wound. It was like all of the garbage was going out as I was releasing him. Maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you're in a situation like, Pastor, I don't know what's going on with me. I feel like there's an oppression. There's literally a demonic oppression in my life. Could it be? Could it be? Could it be that you've got an open door in your life of unforgiveness? By the way, generational curses travel from one generation to the next across the bridge of unforgiveness. It's like the kid who gets mad at his dad. I'll never be, oh, you're up. And yet that bridge. So, so I would say to you at all of our locations, forgive. Everyone say forgive. Begin to pray for them. Make a strategic decision to forgive them. Doesn't mean you have to trust them again. Doesn't mean you have to be best friends again. But you cannot have unforgiveness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute. So who wronged you? Who do you feel like has wounded you? Who hurt you? God is asking all of us, is there anything in us that's bringing oppression into our life? I I feel like I'm really speaking to somebody. Is there anybody in your life that you've not forgiven? Could it be that the present oppression that you're feeling in your life is because of unforgiveness? Number one, pray. Everyone say pray. Pray for those that have hurt you. Number two, pray for reconciliation. Pray for reconciliation. Reconciliation may not always happen in a relationship. I've been a pastor for 25 years. I've been in the ministry literally about 30 years, uh, 31 years. And I, I gotta tell you, it's always great to, forgiveness is a must. Reconciliation is a bonus. Let, let me say that again. Forgiveness is a must. Forgiveness is a requirement. Reconciliation is a bonus. It's wonderful when you can reconcile. You can't always reconcile. You can always forgive, but you can't always reconcile. But you can try to reconcile. What does reconciliation mean? It means to bring back into a place of peace and harmony. Romans chapter 12, verse 17, Paul says this. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, Live at peace with everyone. You may not be aware of this, but the Romans worship the false god of revenge. Let me say that again. The Romans worship the false god of revenge. And Paul is saying, if it depends upon you, in other words, as much as you are able to, live at peace with all people. As much as it depends upon you, after you've forgiven, what can you do to take steps to reconcile? Forgiveness is a requirement. Reconciliation is a bonus. But the scripture is clear. Paul would say, do whatever you can to pursue reconciliation. Live at peace with everyone. Pastor, I can't control what others do. You can't, but you can control what you do. You can't control everyone else's responses, but you can control your response. You can't control everyone else's decisions, but you can control your decisions. As much as it depends upon you, as much as it depends upon you, pursue peace. If I know that I've offended somebody, and I, if I know that I've offended, if I know that I've hurt somebody, man, I'm telling you, I, I, go, I go as far as I can, as high as I can, I go as deep as I can to try to, I don't like at any level feeling like I have offended somebody. Now, I'm not talking about preaching the truth. There's times when I preach the truth, people get offended. Your problem's not with me, your problem's with God. Boy, that was heavy. I didn't mean to say it that way. But your problem's with God. If I preach the truth, and somebody gets offended, leaves church, walks away, does whatever, your problem's not with me, your problem's with God. But if my behavior offends somebody, and it's unbecoming to a follower of Christ, and I find out about it, man, I'm gonna try to do whatever I can to try to reconcile that. Particularly the relationship that's close to me. I I can tell you, everybody, we have what's called an eldership at Church of the King, and we have our lead team and our elders. 
I, I, can, think of th- I can think of just about most of them. There's different times when I know that I've heard them. I'll, I will literally do whatever I have to do as much as it depends upon me. As much as it depends upon me. Question, have you ever gone to that length? Will you go to that length? I don't like how it feels on the inside when I feel like there's an ought in my relationship with somebody. I've gone and showed up at people's homes. I've called, hey, let's have meetings. What can we do? As much, everyone say as much. As much as it depends upon you. Try to live at peace. Try to reconcile that relationship. What can you do? Humble yourself. Ask for forgiveness. Do whatever you can, as much as it depends upon you. Apologize, repent, forgive, as much as it depends upon you. Do what you can to live at peace. Ultimately, you can't control their behavior, but you can control yours. So, Pastor, how do I do this thing? I want to close this way. One of the biggest, I want to say this way, one of the biggest confusions about forgiveness As I've had people say this before, Pastor, I'm going to forgive when I feel like forgiving. Let me help everybody. Here's a memo from heaven. Let let me say this. Here's a literal memo from heaven because I'm going to read it in just a moment. You will never feel like forgiving somebody. Colossians chapter 3. Bear with each other and forgive. Everyone say forgive. Forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. So what is forgiveness, Pastor? How do you do it? It's a choice. Everyone say a choice. So here's how it works. You forgive and the emotion follows afterwards. You just make a choice. I'm going to choose to forgive. Well, I'll, I'll, you ever had somebody say, it's almost like they go into preparation period. And they, they go into mourning and preparation getting ready to forgive based upon the fact that they no longer are going to have their identity wrapped around that they can be, have unforgiveness towards somebody that hurt them. That was good just now. So, sometimes people, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm preaching to more than just one person. Sometimes people go through mourning. It's almost like it's a funeral they go through. They put on black. They're at a funeral, and they think to themselves, I'm getting ready to have to give up half of my identity because half of my identity is unforgiveness towards the person that hurt me. I'm not saying it didn't hurt. I am saying you don't have a right to make your identity around an offense. You got to choose. You got to choose. Just like the Holy Spirit spoke to me about that institution. There were two people there. They lied to me. I've got it on record they lied to me. And it affected me. God's got it on a record that my sins were against me, but Jesus died for me. How many are grateful that record is washed away by the blood of Christ? Some of you guys have been professional bringing up the sins of your spouse The sins of past family. Don't do that. The Bible says when you confess it, as far as the east is to the west, God casts our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Man, when it's forgiven, it's forgiven. When it's cleansed, it's cleansed. Everybody say, choose to forgive. So that man, that pastor, was a pastor. That pastor led me through forgiveness towards my dad. Um, he led me through a process of forgiveness, almost like our freedom retreats. And I got to tell you something. I literally, and I'm not joking, I literally, that night, that night, I literally felt oppression lifting off my life. The next day I felt better. The next day, I felt, probably within a month, literally, I, I, I did not realize, I did not realize that literally unforgiveness, how much of an open door to the enemy you give in your life through unforgiveness. Forgive. Everybody say forgive. For they know not what they do. Whether they knew it intentionally or unintentionally, unforgiveness is still the same cost in your soul. Forgive them. Make a choice to forgive. Even as Christ has forgiven us. You guys receive that word today? Come on. Y'all receive that word? Let me pray for you. I'm going to ask all of our locations just for you to bow your heads. I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting to speak to people right now. Jesus loves you so much. He cares about you. And for those of you that don't know Christ, maybe you've never come to this moment where you've actually trusted Jesus as your Savior, where you've said yes to God. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know if you die today that your sins have been forgiven? Have you ever come to that moment where you've confessed your need for Christ? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to die for your sin and my sin. And his name is Jesus. But you've got to trust Christ as your Savior. With every head bowed and eyes closed, all of our location, those that are joining us online right now, I'm just going to ask you, if you do not know Christ, if you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me, and to make me new. If that's you at the count of three, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. If that's you, one, two, three. Quickly, hold your hand up high so I can see. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you and you and you. God bless you guys up top. I just sense the Holy Spirit right now. God bless you right there. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir, right there. Pastor, pray for me. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir, as well. God bless you, my friend. Jesus loves you. Cares about both of you right there. Church, let's pray with those that are trusting Christ. Can we? It's a sweet presence of the Lord right now. Jesus loves you. He's forgiving you. You're coming into a relationship with him. Church, let's pray together. Come on, can we pray? Say, dear Jesus. Come on, everyone. Dear Jesus, I come to you today. A sinner in need of a savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. Wow, what a powerful message. What an amazing concept, the power that comes from choosing forgiveness. And you know, it all started when Jesus gave his life for us on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And if you're making the decision today for the very first time to give your life to Jesus, we just wanna say congratulations. We believe this is the biggest decision you could ever make, and it is the best decision you could ever make. The Bible says that today, the old is gone, the new has come. Your sin, your past is no more. You are a brand new creation, and we are just so excited. We are celebrating this moment as you begin your new life with Jesus. Yes, what an incredible new journey with Christ. And we wanna do this journey alongside of you. So you can click the link on your screen or in the chat room. And this lets us know that you have made this decision for Christ today so that we can do it alongside of you. And again, congratulations. Well, guys, can you believe that next weekend is Easter? I just want to say right now, please make sure that you are here for one of our many Easter services. It is going to be such a powerful time yes. celebrating the resurrection of our Savior. And so why don't you even right now begin thinking about who are you going to invite to one of our Easter services? We cannot wait to see you next week. Have a great week. We love you guys.